Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Zana Clay. She is Associate Professor in the Department of Psychology at Durham University. She is a comparative and developmental psychologist with expertise in primatology. She studies and compares great apes and young children in order to investigate the evolutionary and developmental basis of hominid social cognition and behavior. Her main interests are the development and evolution of social cognition and communication, focusing on empathy, language, and social learning. So, Dr. Clay, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Great. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, I mean, I, I guess that you focus a lot of your work on bonobos. Is that correct? That is correct, although I'm expanding a bit more now, and I do, I do do a lot of work on bonobos still, but I'm also doing work on chimpanzees and humans. Mm -hmm. Right, yes, because as I said in the introduction, you have an expertise in primatology, right? So I guess that you are now trying to expand to... Yeah, I've always, I've always had an interest in, in um, human, human behavior as well, and, and given that great apes and humans are actually, we're all part... You know, we're all great apes actually in the same family so yeah. to me i think it's important to study i find it important to study both the non-human apes and the human apes to understand the kind of evolutionary basis of our behaviors and also i'm interested in development um and i'm interested in great ape development and human development so i kind of i'm looking at both and now doing some work with cross-cultural populations in different parts of the world to try and uh, capture a bit more diversity in the kind of questions and um, research findings that we can have from humans. Yeah, that's really fascinating. So we're going to focus a lot of our interview on bonobos and their vocalizations and other aspects of their behavior. So sure. could, you, could you tell us first a little bit about their sociality? Because I guess that when most people think about bonobos, at least the ones that are uh, a little bit informed about their behavior, they think that they solve all issues with sex. I, <laughs> I even heard from some people that they even fill in the IRS forms uh, with sex or something like that. So, <laughs> so yeah. could, they, could uh, they, you tell us about uh, I mean, I don't, I don't want to kind of, you know, put water on the party or whatever, but it... Um, they don't solve everything with sex. Um, they, sex actually, sexual behavior is an important part of their social lives, and that is true in the wild and in captivity. But there's other forms of um, behavior that enable them to, for example, promote cooperation, promote social tolerance, um, resolve conflicts, and so on. So I guess it's, um, yeah, it's hard to encapsulate everything there is to know about bonobos in a minute, but. Um, they are, you know, the closest living relatives of humans, along with chimpanzees. Um, and chimpanzees and bonobos are themselves very closely related. So, sort of one or two million years ago, they actually split into the two species. So we do see a lot of overlap, actually, in chimpanzees and bonobos. In lots of, um, when we now are looking across populations, we see more overlaps than we thought. Um, when you actually take into account different groups of chimps and different groups of bonobos. But overall, bonobos are kind of characterized by um, a number of features, but one of the main ones socially is um, they have sort of generally female-led societies. So that's quite unusual in, in, um, in uh, primates and actually generally in animals. So um, what's interesting is they have uh, females generally are at the top of hierarchies. There may be some males as well, um, so it's not necessarily that all females dominate all males, but certainly you have some very powerful females at the top of their ranks, um, and typically they have um, high-ranking sons who are also part of the, like you, you know, the kind of power base in the groups, um, and um, so you have this uh, component, so female-led hierarchy. and it also um, what's interesting there is these generally aren't. Um, related females, so they're not part of sort of matrilines, they're typically immigrants that have come in and developed their social positions, which is again something important for human evolution. 
Um, so they're female-dominated societies. They um, generally are considered uh, less aggressive and less um, physically violent compared to chimpanzees. So uh, although they do have violence and aggression, it's generally less severe yeah. and less frequent. Um, and coupled with that, they have high levels of social tolerance. Uh, and one of the striking parts of their social lives is um, they seem to be relatively tolerant towards strangers. So individuals that are outside of their groups, their communities, they have um, they can have relatively peaceful intergroup encounters, which again is quite different to chimps who show a sort of xenophobic kind of aggression often towards other groups. So um, they live in you know communities of around sort of 20 to 40, I would say on average, or a bit smaller sometimes. And they live in um, sort of these, yeah, in large communities of mixed age, mixed sex, um, and yeah, re relatively socially tolerant um, sort of social lives. Um, and yeah, they do have a sexual aspect of their behavior. So I'm just going to turn this off. They have a sexual aspect of their behavior, which I would think we can talk about, which people are interested in. Um, as a, one of the ways that they promote cooperation and tolerance in their communities. Yeah, sure. So at a certain point there, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you said that uh, the females move between groups, right? So is it the case that the males stay in their group of origin and so we have male philopatry in, in both Yeah, that's typically the pattern. Of course, you get some individuals who will buck the trend and you know, you'll have some females that actually stay in their groups. But generally, the pattern is um, females migrate and there is male philopatry. So the males remain in their natal groups, which is similar to chimpanzees, um, and the females depart at around the age of adolescence. Um, to like basically turn up at another community, and um, that might be a neighboring community, but it could be far away from them. Um, and yeah, so it's interesting that both chimps and bonobos have a similar pattern, uh, but the way that they, the way that that is expressed in dominance um, among the sexes and social relationships is very is a little different in chimps and bonobos. Where in chimps it tends to be male and male relationships that are central to the community. Whereas in bonobos, it tends to be female, male, and female, female. It's a sort of more mixed system, um, which is interesting because they are immigrants typically. Uh, and then their sons, sorry, their sons stay with mum. So the mother and son will kind of form a strong bond throughout their lives. On, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. So since one of your topics of interest is communication, uh, let us talk now about their vocalizations, the vocalizations of bonobos. In what contexts do they vocalize? Well, they're highly social animals and they're living in kind of, you know, large communities. So they vocalize all, all the time, to be honest. I mean, not all the time, but they're very, they're, they're relatively vocally active, I would say. Um, actually, sometimes people say that they can be very quiet, but when I, when I myself have, you know, tuned into listening to them, they're always sort of doing a little peep here and there um, to kind of keep contact and so on. So they produce vocalizations for lots of different reasons. Um, they'll use, for example, peeps, these little high-pitched, very squeaky noises, I think probably to maintain social contact and sort of maintain uh, sort of social, yeah, social relationships, um, social day-to-day -day kind of mediation. Um, they produce uh, vocalizations, for example, in response to food, uh, in response to sex, um, aggression, certainly. We have lots of vocalizations related to that. Any kind of major social event, you'll typically find vocal production. Um, and yeah, and then obviously um, offspring start to produce them when they are showing distress. Um, but yeah, really a wide ranging number of contexts. Really sort of the main evolutionary kind of, uh, evolutionary important aspects of social life, they tend to vocalize in one form or another. Um, we actually don't know if they're more actively vocal than, say, a less tolerant species, but there has been some suggestion that social tolerance in animals might pro uh, promote more sort of vocal flexibility, vocal production. Um, but I would say they have sort of short range calls for, you know, in, inter, you know, within community interactions, but they also have to communicate long distances. So they produce these long hoots. Um, when they're in the forest, they're in what we call fission fusion. So they have sub parties, big parties, small parties. They're all the same community, but they're all split up. 
So those groups will have to use vocalizations to basically figure out who is where, who wants to visit which group, are we going to stay, are we going to go. There's lots of coordination in the rainforest um, to do with vocalizations. Mm -hmm. And in the specific context of food, what kinds of vocalizations do they have? Do they have different vocalizations for different foods, different types of foods? I mean, what kind of information do they convey in that context? Yeah, so yeah, I've done some work on this, and we're still doing ongoing work actually um, on, on the sort of food, food calls in bonobos. Um, so they produce um, actually an, uh, an array of different calls. They produce at least five different kind of major call types in response to different foods. Um, they tend to combine these in kind of long strings of calls. So rather than just producing a single call to a single thing, they actually combine different calls together um, in these sort of longer sequences or strings. And so uh, they produce uh, the main five that I, I've identified, but we probably they do also combine others. Um, are barks, peeps, peep yelps, yelps and grunts. They do also produce various hoots as well, um, and so we kind of want to look into that too. And so the thing that we found, um, although we, we don't find that they necessarily produce a call type to a certain food, we found that there are some kind of statistical probabilities in the ways that they combine calls together to different types of food. So we analysed um, the sort of broader structure of call sequences and we found that bonobos will combine certain call types um, um, to certain uh, qualities of food. So rather than types of food, we haven't really got evidence for that. We do have evidence for um, sort of general quality or the, you know, or, or the, the goodness of the food that seems to relate to uh, these call, different call production and call sequence production. So the idea is that, okay, again, there could be much more in it than we've yet discovered, <laughs> but we think that the calls uh, and the call sequences relate to how good the food is, the quality of the food, potentially how much food there is, um, and then there's some relevant work in chimps suggesting that there might be the amount of food, um, how shareable the food is, um, and yeah, so on. So sort of quite relatively sort of social markers of, you know, um, I, I guess they're indicating to social partners um, what to expect when they arrive at the feeding tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But quality is a, seems to be an important one for them. Mm -hmm. Right. And what about alarm calls? Do they uh, have alarm calls for when they spot predators, for example, or something like that? Yes, they do. They do have uh, alarm calls. Um, so they have some loud, uh, sort of what we call like barks, these alarm barks that they produce that are very high pitched, very loud, very salient in the forest. And they also have some softer calls, some peeps and um, sort of more close range vocalizations. And actually colleagues of mine are looking at um, the kind of intentional basis of these calls and whether or not bonobos are producing them to intentionally inform others about danger. Um, and there's some new data coming out and there's already some nice data from chimps showing that chimps do produce these calls um, in some, you know, sometimes intentionally to inform individuals um, that don't know about danger. So they seem to have some kind of cognitive uh, control over who they produce these calls to and when. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and in the context of sex, do they have specific calls? Yeah, or... they seem to. We, they certainly do produce what we call copulation calls in the context of sex. Yeah. And uh, they seem to have a, yeah, they do seem to be tied to the sex context. Uh, although we actually found that we looked, we did an analysis a while ago now, but of the calls that female bonobos produce when they're having sex with a male, which is a biological act, uh, or it could be, uh, versus when females having a sexual contact with a female, so, you know, a, a same-sex interaction, which is, is by its nature a social event um, for these animals. Um, and we basically found they produce the same call types, more or less. So um, we found that this sort of reproductive signal is being used in a sort of social way for bonobos, which is a bit mirrors the um, sort of sexual, the broadening of sexual function in bonobo society. Yeah, that's very interesting. And before we move on to talking about the role that sexual interactions play in their societies, since we're talking about their vocalizations, let me ask you this. 
Do we know if their vocalizations are in some way innate or if they are learned or acquired or if some of them are innate but others are learned? I mean, what do we know about that? Yeah, it's a really contentious question, to be honest. Um, the kind of basis, the biological basis or the learned basis of um, primate vocalizations. Generally, I think the consensus now is that there is a strong biological basis for these vocalizations. They generally have uh, a universe, like bonobos all around the world will share a similar repertoire. Um, and across, if they have a standard development, they will produce all the calls in the repertoire. Um, and so it suggests to us that they have this um, sort of biological a template for their vocalizations, probably not just vocalizations, maybe gestures as well have this sort of basic shared repertoire. So there's a strong biological sort of aspect to their vocal, uh, their vocal capacities. So that, that's rather different to us. Uh, you know, we can invent and create vocalizations uh, sort of continuously. Uh, we're amazing vocal learners. And so it's been a puzzle that they don't learn so readily. Um, but it's not that they don't have any learning in their vocal system. So there's actually a lot more evidence now that they are able to modulate or modify some of those vocal vocalizations. So we know that, for example, there's, a, there's evidence of some sort of basic sort of dialect differences in different communities. So it's what we sort of generally find is rather than inventing or learning a, a completely new signal, which seems to be outside of their range, again, quite different to us, they are capable of modulating or, 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 um, or learning variants of calls. And one thing that may be um, suggested in some recent work is that they may be able to use calls in slightly different contexts. They can learn to um, produce calls in, 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 in ways that they, they hadn't originally. Um, so there's, it's, it's, it's not black and white, um, but I would say there's certainly scope for learning, but it's still constrained in a way that's different to the, the vocal learning capacities of other other vocal learning species like you know bats and and, and some many songbirds um, some some other mammals can can vocally learn um, primates uh, are more constrained in production and they're, they're very flexible in their learning of perception like their perceptual learning is quite flexible so they can learn to integrate or learn novel combinations and things um, which is why they're quite good at um, sort of you know tracking human speech and things like that in um, you know enculturated animals mm -hmm. Yes, and because I would like to try to connect this with human language, uh, I know that from all the different kinds of calls that we talked about, uh, alarm calls and food associated ones uh, exist in mammals and birds, I mean in different species of mammals and birds. So uh, do we know how far back in, in our evolutionary history do vocalizations go? Oh yeah, I mean it's, it's a good question, it's sort of a bit, a bit beyond what I normally can uh, comment on. I mean, I, I mean we know that for example, you know, amphibians and reptiles produce vocalizations to some extent. So, I mean, I think the evolutionary history of vocal, vocal production is, is vocal communication is very, very old. You know, probably multiple hundreds of million years. Um, I mean, I'm not sure when uh, reptiles first evolved, but I think it's probably like 500 or so million years ago. So, I would say it's hard to know, but I think um, the sort of evolution of the vocal cords and vocal tracts in, in multiple convergent different taxa suggests that vocal production is a, is a very old evolutionary strategy for communication. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and what are the kinds of, uh, let's say, socio-cognitive tools that primates in this case or other animals need to produce vocalizations and to communicate with their conspecifics? Because I would guess that it, it would not only be about their anatomy, but also about some parts of their cognition and their sociality as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, again, it's, a, it's quite a kind of far-reaching question, really. But, I mean, so some people have argued that um, there's sort of issues to do with the, um, the sort of neural connections between the brain and the vocal cords, which might constrain their capacity to kind of control and modulate and learn new vocalizations. Um, and that they, you know, they sort of lack, they kind of control, um, the control, the co cognitive mechanisms for control uh, of those kind of, um, of those aspects of, of vocal communication. Um, I think like a major one is just learning mechanisms. So, I mean, they can learn to produce calls in appropriate ways. They can learn to respond to them appropriately. 
Um, and I think, you know, learn, learning will kind of, you know, the various forms of learning, associative learning and so on, can probably explain quite a lot of vocal production. Um, and, you know, we know, for example, this nice work of early uh, monkey uh, alarm call development of alarm call production, young monkeys, it sort of seems that they're born with a kind of basic alarm call repertoire, but they need to kind of learn to use it to the right predators. So they've kind of got the, they've got the calls there, but then they can kind of, you know, go through these learning processes to work out, you know, when, when and, and to what they produce them. Um, and then I think when you start sort of working with things like great apes, um, you start asking questions about their intentional basis of communication. So whether they have a capacity for awareness of the audience and whether they modulate their vocalizations based on who is listening, not just um, like whether there's someone listening, but specifically if social partners are present, individuals that they might want to strategically inform. Um, so we have evidence, for example, that there should there may be some sort of you know intentional um, uh, sort of more cognitive awareness um, driving some of the great ape vocal communication that perhaps um, goes a bit beyond just these sort of basic associative processes that suggest that they're using these vocalizations or producing them a bit more flexibly. Um, and certainly from the receiver's perspective, there's, there's a lot of flexibility in, in how they're, you know, bringing in social information when they're listening to a vocalization, when they're interpreting it, when they decide to respond. Um, you know, they're not just kind of uh, b blindly responding to everything like they have you know, they have their own, they're integrating a lot of social knowledge um, to, to, to shape how they respond to vocalization. So we have um, quite a lot of different cognitive mechanisms relating to uh, learning, uh, audience awareness and intentionality. Yeah. And do you think that we can establish any sort of phylogenetic relationship between these animal vocalizations and human language? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big goal of a lot of people working in the field of, you know, uh, communication research with particularly with primates, is trying to make those links with human language. I think it would be limited if we only focused on vocalizations, and I think we're now at a point where we're trying to integrate across different communicative modalities. So, looking at what, for example, gestures can tell us, what facial expressions can tell us, vocalizations, and you know, other physical or, or visual forms of communication. So I think yes, certainly they can uh, they can really be informative about questions, for example, about uh, combinatorial signalling, so basic forms of syntax, um, uh, semantic communication, and what we call referential communication. They can talk tell us about um, the nature of um, yeah these more kind of what we call pragmatic communication about um, intentional aspects of, of communication in humans, whether. We, we communicate to inform others, to promote cooperation. Um, we can look at many, yeah, so sort of different social aspects of communication as well as the kind of nuts and bolts, things like um, uh, uh, sort of basic syntax, semantics, and so on. And I think all of the research is sort of trying to address these different packages of language. Um, and I think we, we, we need sort of to integrate more um, across these different modalities, which is starting to happen now, but I think people are starting to get to grips with um, the different aspects. Oh, and, and of course, vocal learning or, or, or signal learning is a big part of um, human language, um, which we're trying to understand in animals. Not just primates, but other birds, um, other mammals, um, even, you know, reptiles, amphibians and so on. So um, there's plenty of work to be done uh, across many animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now let's get finally into the fun part of the interview. <laughs> Let me ask you about the role that sexual interactions play in bonobo societies, because it's certainly not only about reproduction, right? No, no, sex does play a big role. And people always want to know <laughs> what role sex does play in bonobo social life. And it, 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 in both the wild, I mean, I've worked in I've worked in all over the place. I've worked in captivity. I've worked in sanctuaries. I've worked in um, in the wild in a number of field sites. Now, sex does feature in all of those um, social groups of bonobos that I've worked with. So it's not just a it's not just a artificial product of captivity, which some people say it is. Uh, I think the frequency the frequency of sex is probably more enhanced in the, in zoos, and that's probably because um, zoos are you know they're close social spaces. And we think that um, sex in bonobos, so when I say sex, I mean, I think what 
a lot of people are probably um, referring to when they say that is um, a sort of non-biological sexual like sexual contact. So um, bonobos have a lot of same-sex interactions, um, most often between females and also across ages. So there'll be quite a lot of sexual interactions between adults and immatures, um, something people don't always talk about, but it's a very um, a, a sort of common part of their sexual behavior. Um, so sort of non-reproductive sex. Um, and we think that sex plays a role in um, promoting cooperation, um, and particularly among females who, there's some nice work by my colleague um, Liza Moskovice, who sort of recently showed that sex seems to promote uh, cooperation um, and food sharing, for example, among females that, you know, um, you know, they don't have a biological link, so it kind of provides them a, a mechanism to, you know, um, uh, promote social tolerance, reduce tension, and so on. Um, so it seems to function, you know, for enhancing cooperation, um, seems to reduce social tension. Uh, it can be used often following social conflicts um, to reduce, uh, to, to enable reconciliation, restoring social bonds, uh, it can be a bit used in play, but I would say it's generally used in these kind of quite um, uh, relatively tense uh, contexts, actually. I wouldn't say it's a particularly relaxed behaviour in bonobos. Uh, you do see it sometimes, but on the whole, it's about negotiating, I think, um, for example, access to food. Uh, they'll have sex. So, you know, they might arrive in a feeding tree. Everybody wants to go to the best part of the feeding tree. Uh, you know, not everyone's going to be able to get there. So sex will sort of it sort of calms things down a bit, and it will enable some, particularly females and males maybe, to get to have a bit of sex, calm down, feed together, you know, and it deals with that problem. And they also have sex when they're meeting again. So they've had a reunion. So they're often split in the forest. They'll use sex when they come back together as a quick. It's it's, it's not really elaborate. It's, it's a quick rub basically, um, and they tend to look at each other. There's often face to face sex among particularly among same sex, female, female, they will often look at each other in the eye. So it sort of seems to have this um, sort of social aspect to it to promote these relationships. Um, and then the young ones, as I say, young ones um, are quite actively sexually um, involved, actually. And in, 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 it's not, um, it, it really, it, it's a very relaxed encounter. It's not like uh, anything coercive. It's very natural. It's part of their normal behavior. But I think um, it's it's a, yeah it has these sort of social functions. They're quite diverse, but it seems that the cooperation is a big one. Um, in so far, the data is suggesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, it has a very significant social and relational function in bonobo societies, to. right? It seems to. I mean, it's not the only form of behaviour that they use to promote that. So grooming, food sharing, social contact, playing. Like there's lots of other, you know, there's other ways that they they can promote their social relationships and and their social um, sort of uh, tolerance and dynamics. But sex seems to be quite a quick and effective way to do it. So you know, if you're not quite sure, like you know, if you both sort of want the same banana, a little bit of sex is like kind of resolves the, you know, resolves the kind of conflict a bit before it starts. And that seems to be it's sort of quite an effective way of doing something um, in short term. It's a, like a short-term solution. So yeah. Um. Yeah. yeah. So uh, and it seems to me that uh, bonobos have a more a, a vastly more complex uh, socialization than people tend to think. So I mean, in terms of their socio-emotional competence, they have to be really competent in that kind of thing. They have to have social skills, and for example. Uh, they they participate in things like consolating distressed others and things like that. So, could you tell us about that aspect? Yeah. So, I mean, the more we're doing with them um, and the, like using novel experimental methods and ways to kind of look, get at their underlying cognition, we're finding all sorts of um, sophisticated capacities, um, particularly relating to social social problems. So, um, yeah. So, we we like a lot of the research I've done has been looking at. Um, this um, forms of empathy behavior. So we look at how they respond to distress in others and, 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 and how they respond to conflicts and if they're able to resolve those conflicts. And we, we also find that they have this strong propensity to sort of uh, 
uh, respond pro-socially when others are, uh, are distressed. So they will often approach um, someone who's who's feeling distressed after a fight and give them a friendly uh, little hug or a little tug. And we know that that helps reduce the distress of the individual and it's targeted towards individuals that they're close with. So it sort of suggests it's got this sort of maybe an empathic basis. Um, but we're also finding that this happens quite young in early bonobos, like when they're very small. So it suggests to us that they're quite emotionally sensitive to each other's emotional states um, and that maybe the cognition develops later in their, you know, in their, in their, in their, age, um, in their age span. And they kind of integrate perspective taking skills and so on. Um, there's nice evidence that they um, are, can kind of understand that they, they recognize others' needs um, and what others know and don't know. Um, actually, sorry, not so much needs, but I think they, they, they may know like what others need, but they might they don't always actually act on it unless requested. So we, we sort of pro-socially see others in need and we kind of, you know, we, we act, we, we're very quick to often to give them, you know, what we think they need. Whereas um, a big sort of species difference with humans and other apes is they, they tend to do it more on request. So they recognize it, but they're not as motivated to do it. But they have, um, yeah, really complex social lives. Um, they uh, can cooperate in quite advanced ways. Um, they can show all these intentional forms of, of helping. Um, and obviously they can compete as well and uh, they can strategize very effectively um, and yeah they show forms of empathy and we're, we're looking at that and the impact of early life experiences on their social skills um, in, uh, in a population of uh, bonobos but also doing it with chimps now um, looking at the role that um, early early maternal experiences shape how they shape these empathy skills in later life. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So uh, can we compare their socio-emotional development with the, uh, uh, with the human infants in any way? I, I mean, are there uh, at least some uh, phases that they also go through, some cognitive tools that they acquire that are similar to human infants? Even if not in kind, at le or even if not in degree, at least in kind. Or something yeah, like I mean, this. I think actually, yeah, we're trying to address that question right now. I've got a big new project to actually address this question of looking at social and emotional development in respect to empathy, actually, in young human um, infants and also young bonobo infants to kind of track this development and also the um, what impact the social environment has on shaping these behaviors and so we're trying to do that and we think that there's a good basis for this from trying to make a comparison because at the end of the day humans and, and great apes you know we're very closely related we have we face quite similar social problems uh, we know that they show these sort of emotional capacities so um, we we kind of we're at the moment trying to identify these these building blocks of empathy as they start emerging, for example, in early life. So um, we're looking for evidence of things like this consolation. So when they start responding to others' distress, uh, we're using some novel methods such as eye tracking to look at whether or not apes um, understand or are affected by others' needs. So for example, we have a new study where we're, we're interested in looking at whether they have an emotional response to seeing someone else in need uh, and whether that might motivate behavior. Um, we're interested, yeah, we're interested in what we call emotion contagion. So to what extent they're able to share or experience or respond to others' emotions in, others emotions in contingent ways. And there's lots of nice evidence um, from natural behavior, uh, looking at, for example, mimicry of facial expressions. Uh, there's much, there's quite a bit less experimentally so it's, it's still relatively new, but I think um, quite a lot of the core, what we call cognitive uh, and, and emotional or affective building blocks of empathy, uh, we think we can actually um, start identifying them in apes and in young humans. And it might be that we don't find them um, to the same extent, as you say, but I do think they will broadly overlap. I do think that some of the core building blocks are shared between um, apes and humans for things like emotional uh, sharing and empathy. Uh, I think humans, we've got a whole other system, you know, um, that modulates that, that's got all our theory of mind capacities, um, our sort of, you know, our strong drive for cooperation and pro-sociality. 
um, which is probably a little bit more enhanced or, or, or qualitatively different than that in um, in apes. But again, it's a different. I probably think it's yeah more of a quantitative uh, rather than necessarily. There'll be a few qualitative differences, but I think there's quite a lot of overlap. But would you bet on any specific cognitive tools? I mean, do you think that there are any set of them that we will find are common between, in this case, for example, bonobos and chimpanzees and humans? Yeah, I think, so cognitive mechanisms, I think, um, yeah, so I think, like, well, to, act as, to look at something like empathy, I think we'll find quite a lot of similar, some similar emotional mechanisms, so emotional, emotion sharing and things. I think that apes will lack some of the regulation capacities that humans have. So we have these very advanced skills of regulating, mod modulating our emotions, which then feeds into our cognitive capacity. So you say if we're overwhelmed with emotion, it's hard for our cognition to, you know, um, sort of take over. But I would say in terms of cognitive mechanisms, I would say recognizing others, um, other states and what they know and what they might need is probably actually there's some overlap there. Um, and maybe some aspects of their others understanding of others' perspectives and beliefs. But I do think um, the human sort of tendency to uh, try and read others' minds and take others' perspectives is 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 more elaborated in humans. And this idea of us sharing um, sharing common ground with others, um, sharing intentions with others, um, I, I think it probably is. It is a bit different, so I think um, apes apes will certainly show some of those capacities, but I think they they probably aren't going to show them to the same extent. But I, I think, um, which is why we find consolation, uh, we do find these forms of consolation in, in great apes, but they're not you know uh, they're not the same as a you know a psychotherapist really understanding and talking to you about your needs in the same way as a human would, um, you know. <laughs> It's much more here and now rather than a kind of, you know, a rumination on someone else's perspective, which is, I think, you know, what humans are, you know, we, we spend a lot of our time thinking about what others might think about us and the world. So, yeah. Yeah, sure. So the last topic I would like to ask you about is the following. Um, at the beginning, you mentioned that the, the great apes that are the closest to us are chimps and bonobos. And you also alluded to uh, some differences at the level of their sociality, and that probably implies that they are also different, uh, at least in some emotional, social, cognitive aspects. So do you think that there's uh, one best model uh, of great tape that we can use to compare to humans and to try to tr try to trace back phylogenetically some of our cognitive mechanisms. Uh, well, no, I don't think that. <laughs> no, not at all. I think we need to we need to understand um, the sort of scope of yeah, sort of phylogenetic and you know diversity across different apes. Um, not just chimps and bonobos, actually. I think you know, uh, great the, all of the great apes are, are relevant, and and actually other primates and other animals. So, um, I mean, in terms of chimps and bonobos, they are the two closest living relatives. So I think they do give us a, probably the best estimate we have of what we might have looked like before you know, we became human and they became uh, two separate species. So, I mean, given that biologically they are as closely related to us as, um, as you know, uh, they're, they're equally shared in their, I think it's about 98.6 or something like that. Um, we, we, need to, we need to study both of them. And not only both of them, we need to study variation within each species to really understand what kind of environmental, ecological, uh, biological pressures can shape the behaviors we see today. So, for example, chimpanzees um, have taught us uh, an awful lot about, for example, the basis of cooperation in animals, um, tool use, cultural behaviours. They're, you know, one of the best. Well, they're probably the best tool using uh, sort of uh, species in the world. Um, they also show us about, you know, the role that aggression and dominance um, relating to male behaviour is, is is shapes kind of ape societies. Um, and you know bonobos as well um, 
are not tool users really in the wild, so they're a bit of an evolutionary puzzle, things like understanding culture and tool use, but they nevertheless do use tools in, in captivity, so it seems that they have some evolutionary history probably of doing so. Um, but they can tell us a bit more about, for example, the role that um, females can play in, 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 in power, in social power, in, in, in structured societies. They can tell us a bit, I think both of them can tell us about um, social cognition, um, higher social awareness, um, communication of course, um, all of the primate species can probably inform something about about that and you know remember that chimps and bonobos are just the last common ancestors related to us but there's many more that go before them so you know or go or are older than phylogenetically so um, we want to we want to capture diversity and then I would say so yeah we need to bonobos I think can tell us one last thing um, a little bit more about um, cooperation beyond the beyond the kind of family group or the social group so um, bonobos uh, regularly have intergroup encounters um, uh, well, many populations so far have suggested they will have in peaceful intergroup encounters with um, other communities, which suggests, you know, as humans, we are always interacting with individuals we don't know very well, and we're willing to cooperate well beyond our kind of village or our family group. And so I think bonobos sh sh uh, provide us some really nice evolutionary um, evidence of how that can work in another species. Whereas chimps tend to be much more focused on their, they cooperate within communities, not really between communities. So I think the two species plus the context, the evolutionary context, is really informative. And uh, it, it's, you know, it's not the same analogy, but you know, like we need to capture more variation in humans to understand the nature of human societies because, you know, we can't just, you know, continually sample from, you know, Western populations. We want to study it in different populations. So I think we need to do that in apes as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I also asked you that question because particularly when it comes to chimps and bonobos because they are roughly equally close to us from a phylogenetic perspective. I mean, there are people that if they, if they go about cherry picking what kind of primate they will focus on if more on chimps or more on bonobos because they already have a preconceived notion of human nature and sometimes they use chimps to say that we are more aggressive and warlike and things like that and others use bonobos perhaps to push for some liberal or leftist politics or something like that. So, you know, the, uh, and people can create their narratives if, if they just go, if they just go through the trouble of cherry picking the information and focusing on a particular kind of species and also, or yeah, behavior. Yeah, and treating chimps as one entity, whereas actually we know that different populations, are, depending on their ecology, their environment, don't behave all in the same way. Yeah. So, you know, you have some chimpanzee communities who are more uh, more aggressive, more male, male, there's a lot of male coercion, for example, you know, more in the eastern chimpanzees, we find females are not very sociable, males can be quite uh, sort of sexually coercive towards them, whereas, you know, in, in the western chimpanzee subspecies, we find actually females are much more integrated in social decisions, they're, um, there's less aggression, you know, they're more socially tolerant, they're a bit more bonobo-ish, right? So, and you get some captive groups of bonobos who look a bit more like chimps do, they have quite, you know, quite despotic hierarchies, Whereas you might find some uh, wild bonobos who, you know, actually even within the wild populations. So you get this variation, and we want to we want to understand um, what's driving that variation, I suppose, rather than, you know, treating them as a yeah as a kind of caricature of them of of, of a whole species. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Also, as you said earlier, probably taking into account the ecological circumstances where each group or each population evolved in. Right. Absolutely, yeah, exactly, and trying to understand how they adapt within, you know, within current and evolutionarily in evolutionary historical contexts. Um, so, for example, bonobos. A classic thing is that bonobos in captivity are um, very, very good at tool using. They don't have any real differences to chimps. I mean, some differences, but largely the same. In the wild, we basically have very little evidence of tool use in bonobos. They just use them a little bit, but nothing on the scale of chimps. 
So, you know, we sort of, you know, there's these puzzles and it sort of suggests to us that, yeah, the maybe the ecological context vary so much. It's not necessarily the learning mechanisms that are different. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I, I do, I focus on my neighbors because I know them best and they teach me a lot. But I, I wouldn't, you know, and I, I, um, I continue to learn new things about the world from them. Uh, I also have experience and, you know, ongoing research. But it's not that I think they're better or worse or, you know, than anyone else. I mean, I just, I, I mean, I do love them. But, like, I also think chimps can tell us an awful lot, as, as can other taxa and species. So, yeah. Okay, great. So, Dr. Clay, let's end the interview on that note. Before we go, would you like to mention some places on the internet where people can find and follow your work? Oh, yeah. Well, that's a good question. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, I have my Twitter handles, just my name, Zana Clay. Uh, so I post on there and I, yeah, on my, my departmental web page. Uh, you can find some stuff there too. And I'm actually, I've got a relatively large Google footprint. Um, <laughs> so if you want to look me up, you can find all sorts. I've done quite a few talks and things over the years and photos and whatnot. So uh, if you type my name, uh, you'll come up with all sorts of things. <laughs> okay, great. So I will be leaving links to your work in the description box of the interview so that people can go and check it out. It's very interesting. Sure. And again, thank you for yeah. taking the time to come on the show. And it was a real pleasure to have you. Yeah. Nice, nice to to talk to you about it and thanks for your interest. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with leading intellectuals from around the world. And so to keep the channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. You can also support me via PayPal. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Pereira Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantal Gilinas, Francis Ford, Hans Friedrich Sunda, Brian Rivera, Sergio Condriano, Jane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henrik Alenius, John Connors, Doctors Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, and Bo Weingard, my four producers. Isar Webb, Rosie, Jim Frank, and Lucas Stafiniak, and my executive producer, Michel Rogieski. Thank you for all.